Hello viewers, this video will be a continuation of the Khan Academy video on linear and circular polarization. I'm going to just pick up where he left off and continue discussing circular polarization and how it can occur and some of its uses. Specifically, I'm going to be co covering the topics of birefringence and photoelasticity. So picking up where he left off, I have another light wave, which is not to be confused with the magnetic field. Uh, this is a, another electric field component um, which is traveling in a plane orthogonal to the green one. And so if we uh, then uh, consider uh, this zero shift, this is essentially diagonally polarized light that we've broken into two, uh, two different components, a, a vertical and horizontal component. But if we start shifting the light such that we shift this way by uh, a quarter wavelength of pi over 2, then we would have circularly polarized light in the clockwise direction. And if we continue shifting more, we can get back to linearly polarized light, except that we have changed the linear polarization direction to be orthogonal to our original direction. Continuing shifting, we can then get the similar thing going on where we go back to circular polarization, but again, we've shifted to counterclockwise instead of clockwise. And finally, one last shift is a full wavelength shift, which basically brings us back to exactly where we started, and it's as if we should never shift it at all. So we're going to be coming back to this idea, but first I want to describe how, a material, how this kind of sort of effect can happen. And so to do that, we're uh, going to discuss a birefringent material. So birefringence, that means two refringent events, or uh, double refraction is another way to describe it. But you can get... Uh, uh, if you have one beam here in a non-birefringent material, then the light would just get bent through the material and then pass out again. If you have a birefringent material, then you have two, uh, two images that are produced. And this is not to be confused with dispersive, uh, with a dispersive effect some of, from like a, the dispersive prism on the Pink Floyd cover al album cover. This is uh, like Dark Side of the Moon. No, this is, um, this is not a wavelength dependence on the index of refraction. This is a polarization dependence on the index of refraction. And so um, this blue beam would actually have a horizontal polarization and this yellow beam would have a vertical polarization. To understand how this can occur, we're going to look at the crystal structure. So let's look at a, a unit cell. And I didn't just draw this crystal particularly sloppy. It's intentionally skewed such that this blue line here should be considerably longer than this yellow line. And the effect of that is that if we have a light traveling in this angle here, uh, this blue polarization would not, uh, would not really interact with nearly as many molecules as this, uh, this yellow polarization would. And so what that means is that the blue is going to be able to pass more freely through the material, where the yellow is going to slow down more. And that is depicted in the index of refraction. And so we'd have an index of refraction um, where yellow, the yellow direction is greater than the, uh, the, the blue's polarization. Um, and so uh, an example of a material like this would be uh, calcium carbonate or calcite, um, uh, which is one phase of calcium carbonate. Um, so now let's consider white light traveling through our material. But now we're going to consider it traveling straight. And what's going to happen then? Well, it's just going to continue moving straight because the, the angle of refraction is, uh, is based on the incident angle. In this case, our incident angle is 0. It's traveling just normal to the surface. And so it would just travel straight through. But because we have different speeds um, of light traveling through the material, um, uh, based on the, polar, the different polarizations, we're going to cause that shift like we, like we, we saw before. And so um, now let's, uh, let's kind of complicate our setup and put two polarizers. Uh, if, I, if I remove the, the birefringent material, well, then the light would just stop at the second polarizer. And that's because the first polarizer would take the unpolarized light, polarize it, and then the second material would filter out uh, that polarizer, and that's because I've drawn them to be uh, orthogonal to each other. But if we add the material back again, well then we can start getting a phase shift, and that phase shift can start creating circular polarization, and that can allow some of the light to pass through this second polarizer. And so to understand how much of a shift would occur, basically we just need to know the difference in the two indices of refraction, delta n, 
uh, and that's going to govern how fast this shift is occurring. And then we need to know the thickness of the material, and that's going to be how long it's allowed to shift for. And so these two things are going to be proportional to the, uh, the shift. Um, but it gets further complicated, which is uh, the fact that that shift uh, that, we, that we depicted before, that was for monochromatic light, light of one color. And I just said, what am I passing uh, white light through this material? So that means that different, uh, every, every frequency is going to get shifted the same amount, but the effect that that has is going to be uh, wavelength dependent. And so if we're in the intensity of our light, our white light here at the top, uh, at best, the, this is our unpolarized light at the top, so at best we could get uh, half that because the first polarizer is going to cut out half of, our, half of our light intensity. But then the material is going to, uh, to cause this effect such that, like let's say that we tune the material, and the, let's, let's tune the, the thickness such that it corresponds to a full wavelength shift of green light. Well, that means that it's going to be as if the green light never passed through the material and so then when it gets to the second polarizer it's going to be completely filtered out but as we deviate from green we're going to be entering into that circular polarization realm where that circular polarization will have a component that can pass through that second polarizer and as we get further and further away we'll actually get to that pi shift in either direction where uh, the the polarization direction was completely sh um, shifted such that it uh, all of the light that comes out of our birefringent material will pass right through our second polarizer. And so we get this kind of inverse bell curve uh, distribution of, of light intensity based on color. And so let's, uh, let's see what that, what that really, um, what, color that would, uh, what, what color would actually come out uh, and how would we perceive that color. For that we turn to the color wheel and the, uh, because green is all but subtracted, then the opposite color of the color wheel would be what was expressed. So we would actually see this light coming through this material, or through the second polarizer, as red light. Um, now, now that we understand birefringence, I'm going to describe something called photoelasticity, which is uh, what I've been trying to, trying to build to. And that is where we can actually induce birefringence in our material um, by inducing stress in our material. And so to see how that occurs, let's, uh, let's stress this material. So I've just drawn like a very sloppy crystal, and that's kind of to depict a, uh, an amorphous material. So uh, most photoelastic materials are actually amorphous. And, uh, and so amorphous materials don't have a defined unit cell, but they still have an average spacing. And so that average spacing is isotropic, which means it's the same in all directions. But if we uh, squeeze our material, then we start to create anisotropy. We can, we can create our atoms are closer together in this direction and further in the same distant and untouched in this direction. And so what that does is it creates, uh, again, two different indices of refraction based on the polarization. So the ones that are closer together here would have a larger index of refraction. Now, what this means is that depending on how much we stress our material, we will, if we are stressing it, within the setup that we previously described, we would change the color of the transmitted light. And then we can uh, look at a much more interesting setup where we, instead of uniformly stressing our material, we just uh, push, push on it in the center like this. Well, this will create a stress distribution within our material. So now the stress experienced in the material is going to be a function of where you are in the material. And so because different parts of the material experience different stress, different colors of light would be able to transmit through the material. And so now we can, uh, we can see how this, uh, this phenomena can be utilized by, um, by looking at a, a scale model of a bridge that we build out of a photoelastic material. We can then load the material and we will see all these pretty rainbows appear within the material that allow us to visualize this stress field that would have previously been invisible to us. And so this could be very useful for engineers who want to build a bridge and see uh, and use a, a nice old school method for uh, seeing where the weak points in that bridge will be. So I encourage you all to um, look at uh, into photoelastic material. Go ahead and take apart your glasses at the uh, from the movie, and uh, build your own setup and start squeezing plastic bottles and see the pretty colors emerge.